So welcome everyone. Uh, glad you're able to join us. As you know, I'm sharing a few thoughts on estate planning and different matters through these very interesting times. And uh, today we're going to have an unusual experience, a little bit different. And we're going to talk about some issues confronting us with the uh, COVID-19 illness and share one person's experience about it. It's pretty timely, pretty important. All of us are curious about it, wondering what we can do to deal with it, trying to understand it, and so forth. And the person I have with me today has a unique background and a unique experience to share with us. So this good gentleman um, was born and raised in Northwest Missouri and went to University of Missouri, Kansas City Medical School. In fact, he was in the very first class in the uh, what's called UMKC Medical School where they accepted students right out of high school. And if I'm not mistaken, at the end of six years, they would have both a bachelor's degree and a medical degree. And it seems like I remember him telling me years ago that there was almost in his, at his, in, in his first assignment or in his first class, if you will, he was assigned a patient or someone not to work with. And the point is, was very much involved very quickly. Following medical school, um, he went through uh, his residency at Johns Hopkins, where I believe he received his residency in emergency room practice. He's been practicing in the uh, New Jersey area for the past 30 plus years and is co-owner of clinics that help people with their medical concerns and so forth. And uh, I'm really proud to have him on because uh, he's my brother. And some of you know the story of what he's been through. So Stan Farman, welcome. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'll tell some stories. Um, I don't know where you want to start. Um, well, let, me, let me kind of lead you through. And first of all, we have to tell everyone, you know, kind of issue a disclaimer, so to speak. Uh, even as a practicing physician, uh, this is not about providing medical advice to anyone that might be viewing this. Uh, you'll probably have some good thoughts for us, but everyone, I'm sure you would agree, should consult their own physician concerning any treatment or afflictions they might be going through. And I just wanted to get that on the table, and we'll mention that again. But as a physician, uh, you just had a, an unusual experience. So tell us about what happened. <clears throat> right. So um, let me just first say, if I have to uh, <clears throat> occasionally cough during this, I apologize. Um, I'm just convalescing from two weeks of uh, having had COVID-19 that uh, turned into pneumonia. And uh, so that was a little bit of a personal experience and we can talk about that a little bit later. Yeah, so the way I look at this is the last week of February. The last week of February was when the CDC and um, all the government agencies uh, started to ramp um, ramp up the medical community to get ready for this thing. And, and we did all of what we thought was correct. Um, you know, we have um, four or five different practice locations here in, um, in northern New Jersey, and we see over 100,000 patients a year. So, um, you know, we're not just uh, one, one doctor's office uh, seeing um, a regular amount of patients. We had to uh, prepare across our entire platform because everyone had a, a million questions, right? And so we started that last week of February following the, the CDC guidelines. And <laughs> it sounds so antiquated now, but uh, you all remember um, cough, fever, and travel to the five, the five big hotspot countries, remember? So, <clears throat> so we prepared uh, signs at our offices. We physically separated people. We made signs that said, uh, if you have a cough and a fever, go that way. If you're completely well, you can go that way. And that was how we were going to divide and conquer, if you will. And um, <clears throat> so that was the last week of February. So about the first week of March, uh, things started to heat up a little bit. <clears throat> and the first thing that struck me is, how many people never read signs? <laughs> we had huge signs at the front door and interrupting the hallway with big words like important, stop here, read this. 
<laughs> and people would just walk in with their cell phones and oblivious to everything and walk while you're up to the front desk and say, hey, I got a fever and I've been coughing. What should I do? <laughs> so the best laid plans uh, struggled a little bit. <clears throat> but um, for the most part, we were able to separate the obviously sick people from those who weren't. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. Was there just this, what, what happened at the very beginning when people just flooding your offices and what, what must that have been like? They didn't flood it immediately because the last week of February and the first week of March was the, um, the um, dress rehearsal, I guess one might call it the dress rehearsal. So <clears throat> we would have maybe... <coughs> 15 or 20 people a day come in who described that they had a cough and a fever or that they just returned from Italy and so forth. And um, <clears throat> those people appropriately went to, you know, what we call the, the, um, the sick side of the office because obviously we had an obligation to protect patients who were well. But here's where it got very, very uh, cloudy with lots of shades of gray. We did not appreciate at that point how subtle this virus was and how um, uh, people, we've all heard about this since, but how people can pass it without having any symptoms. So for example, I remember the first week of March seeing a patient on the well side of our office and um, yeah, how you doing Copeland, everything good? Yeah, yeah, I feel fine, no problem. Just a little post-nasal drip. That's all this guy had was a post-nasal drip. He had no fever, he had no cough, he had no fatigue, none of the other symptoms. So I said, all right, I'll give you a little medicine, you know, for your seasonal allergy and your post-nasal drip. Three days later, he passed out at home, went to the emergency room and was diagnosed with COVID-19. Wow. <clears throat> and uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's who I caught it from, actually, because, again, we were a little naive. We thought that dividing the two groups of people would on the sick side allow us to wear masks and gowns and gloves but over on the well side maybe we didn't have to do that so much well so obviously we learned and we pivoted and you know everyone wears masks and gloves everywhere all the time now because you know this is a tricky virus it's um it's 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 both very subtle and very very serious and uh, the entire spectrum in between. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and thank goodness most people get the mild to moderate version of it um, and not the really, really serious version of it. So after spending lots of time uh, helping others, treating others, uh, what happened to you? Yeah, so <clears throat> I developed a cough a little bit of a hacking cough and I wasn't sure if it was my seasonal allergies because I didn't feel sick at all not at all and um, so after about four or five days of that coughing I decided to test myself and I did a nasal swab expecting it frankly to be negative but <clears throat> those were the days when the test took about five days to come back and um, so five days after checking myself which is about 10 days after I developed a cough it came back positive, um, and then I developed a fever, and <clears throat> the cough worsened, and clearly I was, you know, in the uh, the beginning stages of the um, of the coronavirus infection, <clears throat> and so I'm 67, and I thought, well, I don't have any underlying medical conditions. I don't have diabetes and coronary artery disease, so uh, I thought, well, I'll I'll weather this pretty well. I mean, after all, how, how bad can it be, you know? It's the flu. But I'll speak a little bit more about why it's not just the flu. <clears throat> and um, yeah, so I got concerned when um, my fever went to 104.7. And um, I couldn't remember one of my grandchildren's <laughs> names. <laughs> I know that's very common, but <laughs> I began to think, okay, this is a little more serious. So yeah. um, <clears throat> I got a, an x-ray done and it showed, um, it showed pneumonia. Um, and it was at that time I decided to go ahead with the 
treatment of moderate um, illness, which is um, the hydroxychloroquine and Zithromax. So I chose that option. And look, I understand all the debate around it. Okay, I get that, obviously. I followed it closely. But from my point of view, it couldn't hurt. And, um, and that's why I chose to do that. Um, <clears throat> and um, so here's how it's different than the regular flu. I think the regular flu is a good starting reference point for everyone to kind of think about this. Um, <clears throat> but qualitatively, you can, you can conclude that it's three times worse than the regular flu, and in some ways even more so. But let me just tell you what I mean by that. So if you catch the regular flu, number one, you kind of know where you catch it because someone at work is sick with the flu, everybody knows it, or someone's sick with the flu at home, and you know, kind of know who to avoid, and oh, darn it, I was too close, and I caught the flu. And within a day or so, your fever goes to 102, and then after about three days, uh, it's all gone. So the first reason why this is worse than the regular flu is it's so insidious, and everyone knows now that you can catch it from people who have no symptoms at all. Essentially, that's the way I caught it. Um, you know, who would have guessed that a little post-nasal drip would have been a highly contagious uh, situation? And um, unlike some of the other uh, very serious um, respiratory illnesses like uh, Middle Eastern resp respiratory syndrome, all of those, um, you know, they usually are very contagious after you get sick with it. And this, this coronavirus business, that's the reason why so many hundreds and thousands and millions of people will get it because it spreads through people that have no idea that they have it until a week later when they get sick. So yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of the first um, difference, you know, it's uh, highly contagious and it's very subtle. You know, people are also sick for a longer period of time. With the regular flu, you can be done with it in two or three days. On Look, if you're lucky with this, you'll be very mild and not even get a fever. But for the average person who gets it, you know, you've got a fever for seven to 10 days. And that's what really wears people out. You know, the fever of 101 or 102 for a couple of days uh, is kind of fixed with Tylenol. But when it's there for a week or 10 days, it, it really uh, 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 saps your energy and your strength and you have no appetite. And uh, look, I have a great appetite, but I lost 10 pounds. I couldn't even, I, I had to force myself to eat like one little piece of pasta. Wow. Uh, but um, <clears throat> yeah, so that's the second way. And then... The third way is the way it ends. Uh, it, um, it um, unlike the regular flu where your fever snaps and you feel pretty good, this just takes five, another five days to just slowly, slowly, slowly go away. <clears throat> and I'm probably, I'm probably 20 days from the development of my cough. <clears throat> And that little cough still persists. So it just, you know, that's why I, I, I can think of it as being three times worse than, than a regular flu. Um, but in some ways, that's not the, um, the final view because mortality is key here. Um, most people don't know that um, mortality for the regular flu is um, one-tenth of a percent. And um, even though the final numbers are not in on this, they'll have to figure it out and analyze it later. <clears throat> the mortality so far is around three to four percent. Yeah, so that's a big difference. That's that means yeah, that's a big difference. Yeah, yeah. that that's thirty to forty percent more lethal. <clears throat> um, and um, so that's a big deal. <clears throat> now the flip side of that coin and. Um, the, the hopeful, hopeful side, uh, side of the coin is uh, that of a thousand people who get this, 960 will, will 
get through it and survive it and live to fight another day. So those are pretty good odds, you know, uh, 960 out of a thousand people will get through it. But, you know, it ain't your regular flu. It's three times worse and, and, um, and more so in some ways. So I remember you telling me or sharing a message that, that, that it even had an impact on you, maybe mentally and emotionally, it kind of robbed you of your optimism in certain ways, maybe. Uh, did I remember, recall that correctly? And what were your thoughts there? So when I entered into this, I thought, well, how bad can it be? <clears throat> but then when I developed a fever of 104.7 and pneumonia, I thought, holy cow, <laughs> this, this is some, you know, serious stuff. Um, I, for some reason, I never thought that I wouldn't make it through, you know, maybe that was just uh, naive, a little naive, but on the other way, on the other hand, um, I never experienced things that I knew were highly critical, even though I had pneumonia. My pulse ox can, was always um, good. Um, even though I would walk up a flight of steps and uh, I'd, I'd huff and puff uh, a little bit and get short of breath. The fact is it bounced back pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, I have to say that um, this is a little bit of a testimony to taking care of yourself, you know, uh, not, not developing lung disease from long time smoking. And if you have diabetes, keep it in control. And if you have coronary artery disease or you're overweight, you know, those, well, quite bluntly, those are the people who die yeah. you know, in general terms. Look, there, there are two factors I call the X factor and the Y factor. The X factor is that 23 year old kid, uh, no, I think it was a 34 year old kid in Texas, boom, gets it two days later, dead. Uh, two kids, a family, otherwise healthy, athletic. Why? You know, that's the X factor. And maybe it will be some genetic stuff that's discovered. I don't know. And then the Y factor is, um, is my wife. My wife, um, you know, was with me during all of this. We certainly kept some distance. <clears throat> and for a day or two, I wore a mask in the house. But then I thought, wow, I can't do this forever. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, uh, my wife said, well, what the heck, you're coughing all over me anyway. I said, well, I'm not coughing all over you. Can't you see me do this? And, uh, but anyway, the point is, she was really, at, she is what the CDC would uh, categorize as a close personal contact. And she didn't get it, you know? I, and I don't know why, again, you know, at some point we'll learn a lot about it, but um, yeah, there you have it. So uh, I have a couple more questions. First of all, what have you learned? And then I want to talk a little bit about, you know, you're somebody with boots on the ground, and I want, to, I want you to speak a little bit about advanced directives and what are going on there, what might be going on there, but just tell us what, you, what you've learned so far. Okay, so... <clears throat> I think the most important thing that I've learned and that the message that I would try to convey is the contagiousness of this stuff. If, if you've ever walked into a, a, a pizza joint and they bring out that fresh hot pizza and you're standing completely on the other side of the room and you can smell that pizza, if you can smell that pizza, you can catch coronavirus by walking through a store or anywhere there are other people. It spreads that nefariously through the air. And um, uh, that's probably the most important thing I've learned. And um, that's why, um, you know, if we done, if we could have done a lot of things different earlier on, it would have just been, you remember all the debate about whether masks help and they don't. And, you know, we could talk a long time about that. Clearly, if you have coronavirus, you need to have a mask on to protect other people. And then for a while, they said, well, if you're healthy, you don't need a mask. Well, fast forward, you know, um, uh, staying away from people and wearing masks at all times, I think, is a, um, a, a good spot to be. Yeah. So what about advanced directives? What 
because in that, virtually everybody who's listening to this, who is a client of ours, and probably some people who are listening who are not clients, have signed advanced directives, and they've stipulated that in the event that they may be persistently unconscious or in an end of life situation or they're terminal, as determined by one, two physicians or by whatever method, they do or do not want uh, artificial means of staying alive. So when someone is diagnosed with COVID-19 and they're admitted to the hospital, what happens with respect to the advanced directive? <coughs> so, <coughs> or the healthcare power of attorney for that matter. Right, right, right. So look, those advanced uh, care directives are critically important. Um, I can't emphasize enough the importance of, of having that up to date and frankly, maybe even having a copy of it on you because um, you know, thing, the, the difference here is that things happen very rapidly and very quickly. And um, if you're in that age group where um, you're at risk, and that means over 65, diabetes, maybe a bit overweight, coronary artery disease, all of those things, um, uh, this particular illness can kind of go along and then all of a sudden immediately crash. And so obviously you need to let, you need to be able to let the doctors and nurses know what your wishes are. Now, let me just throw in my, again, this is not, this is not medical advice because if any of you listen to me and actually do what I say, I'm going to have to send you a bill. Okay. <laughs> so this is just a chat between two brothers. And uh, um, my point is that it looks like people who go on ventilators, are the sickest of the sick. And it's not clear how many of them will make it off the ventilator. But I've seen a lot of cases where they do. They do make it off the ventilator. So I would, I would not want anyone listening to this to say, oh, I've heard it's really bad. And if you have to go on a ventilator, game over, pull the plug. I don't want to go on a ventilator. I would suggest that in this situation, you should want to go on a ventilator because there are, you know, there are based on a lot of things, you know, your age and all that stuff, there are a lot of people that do make it through. So remember 960 out of a thousand make it through and some of them have been on ventilators. So uh, don't leave your healthcare provider confused or guessing because even though you may have something on file in the hospital network or in your electronic record, they just may not have time to access all that. So um, I just want to emphasize again, um, uh, I would carry one in my back pocket. <laughs> so, okay. That's, um, I think, and we think that's good advice too. So what do you see happening? Final question. And thanks for your time. And I know it's <coughs> for you guys and glad you're on the road to recovery. What do you see happening in the next 90 days? What do you think we'll hear? What do you think will end up? Uh, what's your best guess? So um, I'm not sure I can uh, prognosticate that better than, um, you know, Dr. Fauci and the people who do this uh, for a full-time job. You know, they're, they're privy to a lot of data and curves and things like that. And, and they can, they can probably predict better, but um, as I understand it, the numbers look a little better than originally described. The models of how quickly we'll get over this are a little bit better <laughs> than, than, yeah. than we thought. But I still want to say this. I want to say that <clears throat> identify, you see, I'm not so worried about people who are under 60 and in fairly good health. Um, I am really still very worried about the older, high-risk patient, the diabetic and so forth, um, the overweight, the coronary artery disease. Man, oh man, I would identify that person. And if that person's you, I would treat this like the plague for another month, for another month. Let this go through two or three more cycles to kind of infect 
society and let them get, let more and more people get immune to it. And then once more and more people are immune to it, if you're in that high risk group, then you can start venturing out. But um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's my view of what the next 90 days will be like. Okay, well, that's great. Well, again, thanks. Any final words of wisdom? <clears throat> well, yeah, just a, one observation. That is, next year when you go to your doctor for your annual checkup and he speaks to you and asks you about getting your vaccines, <clears throat> I don't want it, any of you to say, oh, I don't do vaccines, okay? So many people don't do vaccines anymore. Well, really? Okay, maybe this will change everyone's perspective. And uh, um, in some of my cynical moments, I've I've told some of my colleagues, you know what we really need is a good plague to make people start giving a shit about their health again. And, you know, maybe this is it. Yeah. Well, and I think you'd even say that about a flu shot. Right, right. We've had that conversation too. So. <laughs> right. right. All right. Dr. Stan Parman, a great brother, and uh, recovering from COVID-19, give your family, give Betsy a big hug, and uh, thanks much for your time. We'll sign off. Appreciate your thoughts. Been a pleasure, Larry Vance. Talk to you All later. Right. See you later. Bye. Bye.